Welcome to module two. In this module, we will concentrate on the gram-positive bacillus, or rod-shaped bacteria. In the last module, we focused on gram-positive cocci. These germs seem to be focused more on diseases of the skin and soft tissue, the urinary tract, and the gastrointestinal tract, and even cause some neonatal diseases. This module will explore more of the systemic diseases and many affecting the nervous system. Now that you are used to the format of the course, we're going to slowly add in some additional outside resources that may benefit those of you trying to gain a firmer grasp on the discussion content. Also, you may find that not all of the answers will be as forthcoming as in module one. Research shows that discovering an answer for yourself leads to greater recall of information than having it all given to you. Though we don't expect you to be an expert at this stage, the goal is to slowly implement more critical thinking skills and less direct lecturing over the next few modules. In getting acquainted with the rod-shaped bacteria, there is more diffuse groupings by genus. We don't have the clusters and chains seen in cocci groupings, although there is a strange term that may pop up from time to time, coxobacillus. As a name would imply, these bacteria are not clearly rod-shaped or circular-shaped. They're somewhere in the middle. Two of the genera in this section are also classified as curved rods, the cornibacterium and listeria. The actinomyces and nocardia are considered branching shaped rods due to their groupings under the microscope. The main genus to be discussed in this module are listed for you, with Bacillus being a description as well as one of the genus. I guess they were just a bit lazy on the naming scheme for Discovery Day on this one. There is only one main species within each of these genus that is medically relevant, with the exception of Clostridium and Bacillus. Unlike the preponderance of skin, urinary, and GIT diseases that we saw in Module 1, this module will be a little more varied, with a higher concentration on the nervous system and tissue necrosis. Actinomyces and Clostridium species also fall under the ABC anaerobes group. The mycis suffix is a bit of a misnomer since this means fungus in Latin, which can throw off students at first. We'll see this term used a lot more in the mycology section. The most important differentiating factor in Clostridium species is the fact that they are spore forming. This allows them to survive in a lot of places that other bacteria wouldn't be able to live. This hibernation-like state makes them very rugged and is not uncommon to find certain species surviving in soil. The first species in the Clostridium genus is Clostridium tetani. With C. tetani, there is a common misconception that the bug likes to live on rust. It is actually the soil covering the rusty object that is usually the harbinger of this microbe. The rust simply allows for more surface area and a greater chance of colonized soil to enter the penetration injury. Tetanus is a resulting spasm that may occur after a puncture wound occurs. Initially, there may only be occasional muscle twitching. The jaw is one of the most common initial presenting locations. This is a good sign to get to the hospital. If caught early, the bacteria toxin can be bound by antitoxin and the invading bacteria treated. This is only normally seen in industrialized nations with unvaccinated individuals. Clostridium botulinum is the same germ used in the facial injections to get rid of wrinkles. As opposed to muscle spasm seen in tetanus, botulism causes muscle weakness and paralysis. A botched botulism injection, often performed by a pseudo-doctor of some sort, can lead to a paralysis of the face and neck, potentially spreading to the rest of the body. Most adults are, are able to tell if something is not right and make it to the hospital before serious complications occur. Children, on the other hand, aren't always so lucky. Floppy baby syndrome is a paralytic disease of newborns and infants. Classically, this occurs after ingesting honey, which can contain botulinum spores. Remember, heating doesn't always kill spore form bacteria very effectively. This is also seen in home preparations of canned and jarred foods. If not properly sanitized, the bacteria will grow within the container and continue producing toxins, which are later ingested. C. perfringens is the third of our four Clostridium species to discuss. These last two are both found in the gut and lead to tissue disease. The most common presentation for the microbe is simple food poisoning, which is self-limited and doesn't require treatment. However, a more severe complication, and more likely to be tested on, is gas gangrene. This tissue and muscle necrosis leads to gas formation under the skin. C. perfringens toxin leads to increased vascular permeability, causing leakage of fluids and the spread of necrotic factors. Clostridium species are also a high concern for nosocomial infections. In fact, C. difficile, or C. diff, is one of the primary causes of nosocomial gastroenteritis. It can be found in the normal flora of many human gastrointestinal tracts, as well as the water and soil sources. Due to it being normal flora for some, with no apparent ill effects, 
it's easy to see how it can become spread from one asymptomatic carrier to a patient. C. diff can lead to toxic megacolon, which is a dilation of the colon by paralyzing the colonic nerves. Often this requires resection of the infected bowel. C. diff causes several colitis-like symptoms with a special presentation of a membrane on the colon wall. This pseudomembranous colitis is fairly specific for the bacterial pathogen. Many gastroenteritises can be separated by watery or bloody diarrhea. However, C. diff can cause watery or hemorrhagic diarrhea due to separate toxins that it holds. Moving away from Clostridium, we have the first curved bacilli of medical relevance. Listeria monocytogenes is a relatively rare pathogen in the general public. Classic questions regarding this microbe would often mention something regarding eating deli meats or possibly drinking unpasteurized dairy products. Though still it's a possible illness for anyone, there are certain demographic differences that make this more important to consider. For example, it likes to take advantage of the weak, aka the immunocompromised, namely those on immunosuppressant treatments, chemotherapy, HIV-infected individuals, the very old and the very young. The most severe disease is meningitis, though it may also cause systemic diseases such as sepsis and bacteremia. The second curved rod is a very common one and actually related to the tetanus vaccine we discussed previously. Diphtheria is found in the throat and skin of the human host. Luckily, the tetanus diphtheria or tetanus diphtheria pertussis vaccines prevent most of us from ever succumbing to this pathogen. The gray pseudomembrane seen in this image of the patient's throat is pathognomonic for diphtheria. Though less common, it's also an important cause of heart block. This is where part of the conduction pathway in the heart is blocked, leading to an abnormal ECG reading. Lastly, this can also be a cause of tracheitis, along with dozens of other bacteria. Base your differential diagnosis on other presenting signs and symptoms. Anthrax was not a common household term until the anthrax male scare in 2001. Now Bacillus anthraxis is on the radar of anyone concerned about bioweapons. What many don't realize is that anthrax is actually found in the soil around us as well as on some animals. The anthrax disease comes in two main forms, cutaneous and pulmonary. The pulmonary version was more common many decades ago due to differences in farming practices, though it still may occur by any inhalation scenario. More commonly associated with anthrax today are the cutaneous symptoms that can lead to tissue necrosis. Bacillus cereus is a more common pathogen in this family. It can be found on classically fried rice and other food left out for hours. It just leads to a self-limiting food poisoning, though far less severe and serious than anthrax. It is also a commonly tested question to be aware of. Actinomyces israelii forms a fungus-like branching shape on culture. In the 70s, it was actually thought that this was a fungus by some researchers, leading to the name of it in the mycosis organisms. Now we know that this bacillus is a hardy bacterium found in the human GIT and genital urinary system. Particularly, it can be found in the mouth, leading to localized disease. Facial abscesses and jaw deformities are the most common disease. However, in rare instances, it has also been known to be a cause of bacterial vaginosis, as well as tissue inflammation in other parts of the body. Nocardia asteroides, like many of the bacteria in this module, can be found in the soil. Fresh water ponds, hot springs, and streams are another place that this bacterium enjoys hanging out. If you've ever been to a hot springs, for instance, and see a warning sign about microorganisms in the water, this may be one that they were warning you about. A common way that this bacteria enters the body is through the nose, which is in close proximity to the brain. Once inoculated, the individual may develop brain and lung abscesses, as well as disseminated infection. Many times, by the time the symptoms present, it might be too late to treat. Even if caught early, this organism requires months of treatments. To summarize this section, we have soil dwellers that were a common theme, but their presentation can vastly differ. Instead, that's categorized by disease location, as that'll make it easier to differentiate between similar presentations later on. For nervous system-based diseases, we have the hypoactive and hyperactive. Botulism leads to paralysis symptoms, while tetanus opposes this presentation with muscle spasticity. We have nosocomial infections as a possibility by several of the Clostridium species, namely C. diff and occasionally C. perfringens. GIT symptoms are mostly consolidated to C. diff for this module. C. perfringens is found in the gut, but besides food poisoning, there aren't the usual gastritis-like diseases, the other cause of food poisoning being B. serious. In discussing skin and soft tissue presentations, now we can add C. perfringens and anthrax to the list. 
With the addition of these to Staph aureus and Group A strep, the group of diseases is becoming more elaborate. The branching rods can cause tissue and organ-based necrosis. Echinomyces may also produce fistulas in the mouth, leading to the epithelium, requiring surgical correction. Lastly, the curved rods don't yet fit into a good category. Listeria joins group B strep as another cause of neonatal meningitis, but it also is seen in organ transplants and other immunocompromised states. Diphtheria becomes one of the first serious causes of lung complication. It is generally easy to distinguish this from other causes of pneumonia and lung disease based on the characteristic whooping cough. Enjoying the material? Would you or someone you know like to help free med ed grow? If so, please send us a message on social media or via the website contact form with any questions or skill sets you would like to offer. With your help, more robust content can be made to benefit all learners.